We use these terms big boned and thick within our community all the time, but what do they really mean? And more importantly, what do they mean for your health? And when should you be concerned? Can someone be big boned and still be healthy? Should we all be aiming to be the lightest weight possible? I'm Dr. Tai, and we're gonna break all of this down with two obesity experts right now. Today I have with me Dr. Kathy Earls, who is a board certified pediatrician, and she's also board certified in obesity medicine. Earlier this year, she published an article, A Call to Action, Addressing Obesity in the Black Community. I also have with me Dr. Fatima Cody Stanford, who's one of the first fellowship trained obesity medicine physicians, and she serves as an international expert on the topic of obesity. I'm happy to have you both here. Thanks for having me. Thank you. So in our community, we hear the terms, you know, he's not fat, he's big boned, or someone's thick, they're not obese. Let's just clear it up right now. Is there mm -hmm. a difference? Is someone who is thick or big boned, as we might say, somehow healthier than someone who has a diagnosis of obesity? It's important for us to note, first of all, this idea, this concept of big bone is actually a fallacy. Individuals that carry more excess weight, their bones are smaller. So this idea of it just being about bone size is actually completely wrong. Um, so it's important, first of all, to note that. Now, when we're talking about this term obesity, obesity is a disease. And it's important for me to get that across of nothing else during this conversation. It is a disease process characterized by inflammation and a host of other issues. But it's important for us to note it is actually a disease. And often what people will tell me is that, oh, I don't really have any issues. I just am heavier. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, that heaviness, um, that excess weight is actually a disease process. So I think the key thing to, to realize is that we're talking about a disease, a disease that requires treatment, whether it be lifestyle modifications, behavioral modifications, um, medications or surgery or combination of all of those. So I would say completely false, Dr. Tai, um, in terms of how we look at this. But, you know, I'd love to hear what Dr. Earls thinks. No, I would agree, um, of course. I would agree. I'd also like to say that a lot of times it depends upon where the um, excess weight is. For example, we know that if it is what we consider to be subcutaneous or uh, right underneath the skin, that it's not as bad as if it's around the organs or what we call as visceral. In other words, just deep down covering your organs like your heart and kidneys and so forth. Particularly around the waist section is where we find it to be the most pathological or the, the, the worst for our health. So how would somebody know which one they are? How can they tell if, oh, I just have, you know, subcutaneous fat, fat that I can, you know, see and pinch versus mm -hmm. it's actually covering my heart, my liver, things like that. How, how can they tell? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there, there are a few ways. Um, the first thing I always do and that how we can tell if you're at risk for other conditions associated with your obesity is do something as simple as measure with a waist circumference with a tape measure, okay? So a $5 tape measure, what you can do is take that tape measure, put it at your belly button and go around the circumference, no clothes on, just bare skin and get a sense of where your waist circumference is. So going back to what Dr. Earl said, where you carry that adipose tissue, adipose is a fancy word for fat, adipose is an organ, and where you carry that fat is important. So our target for um, women versus men is as follows. For women, we want your waist circumference to be less than 35 inches around that wider circumference. And for males, less than 40 inches. Now, for the guys that may be listening, it's important for us to not go just based upon what your pant size is. So men are like, oh, why well, wear? I wear a 38. And then when you actually measure around, it's 54. So we're going to go with where you actually carry that weight. Very few people wear their pants where Steve Urkel used to wear them up high. So they don't have a general sense of quite where their waist is. So that's, that's the key thing I would look at. Now, Beyond that, as doctors, we can do things like order um, ultrasounds of the liver, for example. The liver loves fat. And if you guys like, what does my liver look like? Think about like when you're walking around the grocery store and you see liver, chicken liver, kind of looks like that, it's just much bigger. 
and the liver loves fat. So you know how it looks like that nice kind of pure kind of dark color? When it has fat in it, it looks marbleized, kind of like a piece of steak, kind of marbleized looking steak. We don't want it to look like steak. We want it to look like a nice clean piece of liver. But what's becoming the number one reason for liver transplants in the United States is non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Something you may hear, hear us call NAFLD, which is non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And that's because the fat has gone into the organs. And we see that in children, we see it in adults. I'd just like to um, agree wholeheartedly and, and, and also to kind of accent one thing that Dr. Cody Stamp mentioned about um, children and about how we're seeing um, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease in children. And I think that's an excellent point. Uh, there was a time in which we didn't have the prevalence of obesity in children was much lower. But as we've seen the rise in the adult population, likewise, we've seen that in the pediatric population as well. And uh, that's something that's near and dear to Dr. Cody Stanford and I, because that's one area where um, what the parents do directly affects what happens in the family and what happens with the children. And we know that as children grow, the older they become, if they continue to carry on this excess weight, the more likely they are to carry it on to adulthood. And so you not just start with all the, um, we call them comorbidities or all the other things that come along with uh, your weight in an adult, but you actually begin that as a child and you keep it for longer. Therefore, the outcome is often worse. Absolutely. So should everyone essentially just be aiming to be the lightest weight possible? Like, what are you, what are you telling folks? No. So actually, I think Dr. Earls and I are going to align here again. You know, I tell patients that we want to get them to the happiest, healthiest weight for them. You know, I don't think that everyone is going to be the same size or we should shoot for the same number or whatever it is. And actually, if you were to ask any patient I've ever seen um, whether or not I've given them a target weight, they will tell you I have not. The reason is because I have no idea what their target weight is. You know, I will try different therapies depending upon the severity of their disease. Um, and even if I were to, let's say, consider surgery as an option, um, not everyone responds to surgery the same. I can use different medications. People respond differently. The three of us on this call, if I were to put us on the same medication, you know, one person may lose a fourth of an ounce, which is basically nothing. Somebody else may lose 20 pounds and the other person loses 50 pounds. Is it saying that one of us is worse than the other? No, it just means that the way our biology works with whatever is, is different. And so what I try to do is find the best possible therapy or combination of therapies for the patient to get them to their healthiest selves. I have one patient, for example, who started with me at 550 pounds. Um, he's now down to 300. And so if you were to see him, you might make some biased judgments. Oh, he needs to lose weight. He needs to do this. But I would say he's lost 250 pounds. I would say that he's done a really excellent job. What I've seen in my work with him is he's kind of stabilized around 300 pounds, but he's able to move, he's able to run and jog, he's able to do everything that he wants to do. And if you look at like all of the things we look at, like cholesterol and, and um, indicators for diabetes, it looks perfect. I mean, so for him, that's his happiest and healthiest weight. And so I'm not gonna call him a failure. I'm gonna call him a success. We're talking about healthy weight. We're not talking about uh, you know, looking as though you should be on a video or something like we're talking about what is health. And so Dr. Cody Stanford mentioned that patient went from 500 to 300 and, and many would see that as 300 as still excessively large. But what she also mentioned was the fact that he is able to be active. He's able to um, uh, exercise and the numbers that we look at in terms of the, the laboratory values are normal. So that's, a, that's healthy for him. You know, since a lot of folks in our culture, you know, we kind of normalize curves mm -hmm. and sometimes normalize excess weight. Um, and actually, I, I've seen, you know, sometimes we shame folks for being too thin, we meaning the community as a whole, right? So if that's the case, what should make someone realize, okay, this is obesity, I'm not just curvy? Like, what's, what's the trigger? What do you 
what can either, you know, help you either feel, okay, feel like, okay, I'm okay, or be the trigger to say, I need to do something about this. Mm-hmm. What should folks mm-hmm. be looking mm-hmm. for? So I, I don't want to go first all the time. I don't mind though. Um, so um, I think that, you know, you, you can use your doctor's visit with your primary care physician as a gauge. Um, with pediatricians, um, we are always plotting out on growth charts. A lot of this is done electronically for us. Um, and for, for pediatrics, if you are between the 85th and 95th percentile, um, you have overweight. And then if you're over the 95th percentile, if you're between the ages of two and 20, um, because that's where the growth charts are, then you're, you have obesity. So it's important for us to note those growth charts. So for example, I saw a young woman today who's 17. And if you look at her growth chart, she's been two standard deviations above, above the normal growth chart since she was six. That was the earliest data that I had. So I have 11 years of data that shows me she stuck to her curve, but her curve was always twice as high as we would like it to be. So, um, you know, they had done a lot of different programs with her, but there was a strong family history of obesity, which likely is why she struggles in the same way she does. For adults, you know, we we do use things like BMI for the whole population, but then we narrow in. We can go and narrow in on like your full total health assessment and the primary care doctor, whether they be a family physician or an internist, um, can do that and help you kind of discern. Um, Beyond that, if you're still struggling and if your primary care doctor struggles, that's when you'd see someone like Dr. Earls or myself, someone that's trained and and, or board certified in obesity medicine that could help encourage you with other treatment modalities beyond maybe what is in the toolkit for the primary care physician. And that's fine. You know, it's easy to find us. Um, If you go to the American Board of Obesity Medicine, you can go and search for a physician by zip code or by city and state and see who's in your area. So if you were to look up someone in Boston, you would find me um, along with a lot of other docs because there's, I think, more in Boston than anywhere else. And then if you were to look up Dr. Earls in, in my hometown of Atlanta, you would find her listed. So that's that's exactly what I would do. But Dr. Earls, anything you want to add? Yeah, I was just thinking about just when we talk about uh, BMI or, or, or body mass index and whether it's elevated or not, we all know, let's say, for example, um, your 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 body mass index or your weight is going to depend upon, as Dr. Cody Stanford, one of them is going to be your, your, your family makeup, right? So let's say if, for example, your body mass index indicates that you are, let's say, above 30, which would be classified as obesity in an adult population, um, and you come from a family of that, and uh, let's suppose that part of the treatment that we give for um, when we're trying to, to, to secure weight loss is to increase your physical activity. So let's say the, the recommended daily, the recommended allowance is like 150 minutes a week. So let's say if you have a body mass index that's 30, but you're able to exercise 200 minutes a week of, of vigorous physical activity, uh, and your laboratory values are all normal, your cholesterol is normal, your HDL is normal, your blood pressure is normal, all of that, then I think we, consider that to be perhaps a heavier weight, but in a healthy perspective, because that person is in fact physically active, laboratory values are normal, they have a, a, a healthy diet, from a genetic predisposition, they may be larger. So I think it's important to look at, oftentimes we talk about numbers, it's um, in terms of the scale, what does the scale say? It's more than the scale, it's how healthy you are from a, um, from a medical perspective, not just the weight, but your actual health. I think that's key for people to understand. So it sounds like what I'm hearing, if you do calculate your BMI or you just have concerns in general of with your weight, to definitely make sure you're at least going to your primary care doctor, getting your annual checkup that will do those fasting labs mm-hmm. like cholesterol, getting your blood pressure checked, things like that. Mm-hmm. Because it sounds like if they're normal, then it may not be as much of an emergency as if those are obviously abnormal and there are signs of diabetes or prediabetes or high cholesterol. Is that right? Yeah, so I think so, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, disagree a smidge. So, you know, a lot of people, and I have this happen all the time, I have it happen in my family where 
they have patient or people, I guess these are family members or um, have excess weight and those things appear normal. We have to still remember obesity in and of itself is a disease. And sometimes we don't pick up things um, just at a kind of a cursory look. So if you were to do a normal panel for some of the primary care physicians, you may miss certain key things. But like that 17 year old, going back to who I saw today, um, I check, checked a fasting insulin level and saw that was twice normal. But if you looked, uh, insulin, for those of you guys that are listening, is what the pancreas pumps out to keep your blood sugar normal. But fasting insulin isn't something that's on a normal panel that would be checked by a primary care. So you wouldn't have known that was elevated unless you checked it. Um, I also check for inflammation. I may do a CRP or ESR. And for you guys, you don't have to know all that I do. So if those are elevated, that's signs of inflammation, which is often just attributed to the excess adipose tissue, which is fat. Remember that fancy word adipose? That's your vocabulary word. So adipose tissue, that increased fat. So all those things may look normal. If we do a little bit below the surface of that primary care and go deeper, just a smidge deeper, not really fancy, still, still normal labs, but just a little bit deeper, you can uncover things. And so if you looked at the 17 year olds, like cholesterol and all of these things, they look normal. Her fasting, fasting blood sugar was just slightly above, but that insulin was like double normal. And so that gives me a sign that even though things looked okay, I'm a bit concerned because these things along with her, those inflammatory markers are up. And I think it's, I would be remiss um, if Dr. Earls and I did not discuss the, the um, significance of obesity as it relates to COVID-19. Um, what we have found to be the greatest risk factor for morbidity, which means sickness, and then mortality, which means death, related to COVID-19 is obesity. And people are perplexed by that. Um, and it was very interesting to watch the early days of the pandemic here in the U.S. where you might be watching CNN and you say, oh, they'll say, you know, we have this father, 50 years old, who was, you know, had no medical issues. And I'm noticing that the patient has evidence, at least um, visually, of severe obesity, but that wasn't considered mm -hmm. to be an issue. And so at time and time again, what we continue to see here in the U.S. and around the world, that obesity, may, often without any other issues, rose to the level of, of interest that it did cause greater sickness and unfortunately, greater death. What we found with obesity is that patients with obesity are three to four times as likely to die from COVID as someone that does not have obesity. And so we have to pay attention to that disease in and of itself devoid of those obesity associated complications like Dr. Rolls were talking about. Now it intensifies, right? So we can intensify that stage of obesity if you have high blood pressure, if you have sleep apnea, if you have all of these additional things, but it's important to note that by itself, it still is something that we should be paying attention to. And often people like myself and Dr. Earls who are obesity medicine doctors are gonna know how to do that dive below the surface to know how to really see what's going on beneath the hood if you guys are car enthusiasts, okay? Yeah, yeah. there's one thing um, that Dr. Cody Stanford mentioned about the, the insulin and I just wanted to point that out. Um, oftentimes we think of, Dr. Cody Stanford mentioned that her patient, the insulin level is much higher than it should be. And a lot of times we think of your diabetic doesn't have enough insulin. So in that particular condition, Dr. Cody Stanford is actually catching the patient before their pancreas gives out. Their pancreas is pumping so hard now to attempt to normalize the, the sugar, to, to take the insulin takes the sugar into the cells and the pancreas is working twice as hard now to do what it did um, with twice as much insulin because it's sick, right? But there will come a certain point if there is not any intervention, one in which weight loss is one, in which the pancreas will stop. And that insulin level, instead of being extremely high, trying to do the same thing and trying to be normal, it will be non-existent. So. And I, I love the way she said it. Let me, let me give even a new caveat. If you're still like, what's in the cell and stuff like that, you're like, I didn't like science. So I think of it as like, you know, kind of running on a treadmill, you know, 
if you're going at like a pace like this, so hopefully you guys can see my arms. You could do this mm -hmm. all day. I mean, eventually you have to go to the bathroom and eat, but you know, let's just pretend like you didn't have to do those things. But if you start running and let's say you're going at mm -hmm. nine miles per hour, you can only go that fast for so long, no matter how mm -hmm. athletic you are, you will tire. Mm -hmm. And that's what's happening to the pancreas when those insulin levels increase. It's running really, really hard to keep your sugar down. And eventually we got to stop. And that's when we have to start giving you insulin, okay? Mm -hmm. So that's that is confusing, but I, I like the way she explained it. I just wanted to add a little a little sauce on top of that. So this is great. Tell me though, how do you guys counsel your patients um, and their families about trying to balance all of this science, right? Which totally makes sense. I don't think that anybody listening to us is like, oh, that doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. um, but you also have to balance it with the cultural pressures, right? And Thanksgiving yeah. dinner and Christmas dinner and traditions and right. all of that. What do you guys do? How do you address that with folks and their families? Because sometimes you may just be getting one person in the family. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. they may be the lone person showing up at mm -hmm. Christmas with this newfound you know, philosophy because they want to be healthier, but the mm -hmm. whole family's not on board. Mm -hmm. So how do, you, how do you deal with that? Do you talk to the whole yeah. family? What do you say to the whole family? Help, help folks out there. I, I think ideally, but de de depending upon the age of a patient, in pediatrics, the whole family, it's imperative that you get the entire family to buy in. And I don't just mean um, uh, parents and those living in the household, but those that have intimate contact with that child, the grandmothers, the neighbor, whoever. It is, it is crucially important that you have family buy in and whatever that family looks like. You have to have that buy-in to be successful. Um, then the, the other thing is, I think sometimes we become so disappointed. People think that if they need to make a change, they have to make this, this huge change today. Like, I, I'm not active at all, right? And tomorrow I need to run a marathon. That's not what we're saying. If we just start from a place in which you can ensure success. Like say, for example, I, I had a, a, a family that uh, the, the child consumed a six pack of Coca-Cola a day. There's no way I can say stop Coca-Cola and, and that will occur. That would be to set them up for failure and disappointment. But what I can say is perhaps today, let's have five, right? Let's do that for a week and then let's go down to four. And let's say by the end of the month, maybe we'll just have two a day. That's a point of success. That's a lot of calories, a, a lot of sugar, a lot of things that we're eliminating. So just to kind of start at a place where you can ensure success and not disappointment with something small, with something achievable uh, as a goal is, is, is a good place to begin. Yeah, I think that Dr. Earls brings up a great point. We want sustainable change. Mm -hmm. But you know, when I when I would think about the family, especially black families, I think the key thing is is that we are used to seeing a much larger body habitus. What we do know is that black women have the highest rates of obesity in the United States, almost 60% of black women. Um, and then another 20% have overweight, which means if we're looking at black women, our family, our friends, um, we're talking about almost 80% of black mm -hmm. women with overweight and obesity, which means, Dr. Dr. Ty, when we're looking at um, what's in families and what we're seeing at the holidays, well, first of all, you shouldn't be traveling this, this year, but mm -hmm. in other holidays, um, is that if you come in and you're much leaner, then you may face you know, negative talk from the family. I take care of a lot of whole families where I'm taking care of the children, the parents, and the grandparents. And, now I have a family where I'm taking care of the children, the parents, the grandparents, and the great-grandparents. That's the first time that's happened. Wow. But what I like about caring for patients across that continuum is that I may be doing different treatments. Remember I told you it's about tailoring it to the patient, but the messaging through that family is the same. So if they get me today, or if they get me in three weeks, or if they get me in five years, or 80 years, I mean, if I'm still around, they're gonna hear a similar message. And, and those families, it's not surprising that there would be less pressures. Now, let's say one family member, and I actually have this one family of five black women I take care of there, uh, a family that's near and dear to my heart. Three of them are sisters, and then I take care of the offspring, so the, the daughter of sister one and then the daughter of sister two. All five have had surgery, all five. One did 
really, 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 really well. And they call her a negative name, mostly mm -hmm. because they're jealous because she did so well. Um, and actually was one, I think the second heaviest of all of them. Um, and when they're in the office, I scold them, right? So because I know that one of them told me this negative name that was called, and, and, and with my intervention as an outside party, that can start changing the dynamics. Now, they may still think it because they're jealous that she did so well. I'd, I had no idea that her body would respond to the same therapy in such a dramatic fashion. So I would say be nice. You know, we were taught manners, mm -hmm. so be nice. And even though you may, you know, be a little, little salty about the fact that someone has done better, that everyone, we should celebrate everyone's success, whatever that looks like for them. And the story is never over. Obesity is a chronic relapsing, remitting progressive disease. It means it kind of, you know, sometimes it's not so bad. Sometimes it's worse. It comes, it goes. It's, it's part of a lifelong journey. And what that means is that at different points in time, people may have different weight status. And it's, it's okay. It's part of what we expect. That's what obesity is. And so just continue to work at it. It's not something that you just kind of poof. I had surgery. It's solved. No, even if you had surgery and you initially lost weight, your brain, which is the organ that controls weights, is going to try to push it back to where it was. It's always going to try to pull it back. And so you want to be engaged in long-term care with regards to your obesity. The intensity may differ at different times based upon the severity. And it's okay. That's, it's just like any other disease. Sometimes your blood pressure is really great. Sometimes it may not be. Sometimes people that have diabetes, maybe their blood sugar is really great. Sometimes it's not. You know, like we have to constantly work and tweak things to, to optimize it for the patient, you know, whoever they are. Is there a good resource that's available um, in the same scenario I gave someone is making some major life changes to become healthier, but they can't get their family on board? Is there some place they could direct their family members to read or to look at? Well, I'm a partial to my book that I wrote called Facing Overweight and Obesity. Um, it's a lovely guide through everything about overweight and obesity. I call it a complete guide for children and adults. So I think that's a great resource. It's available on amazon.com on either paper format or if you're a Kindle subscriber, it's, it's available through that. Um, you know, I do a lecture that um, Dr. Earls, I think, has seen me give, Dr. Ty, mm -hmm. you may have seen me give, um, that's freely available that really explains the complexity of obesity. Um, and so Dr. Ty will make sure you have access to that. But if you Google Radcliffe and Fatima, my first name, um, this lecture, which has been viewed over 20,000 times, comes up and it really teaches you about the disease. And we look at different patients and how they respond to therapies. And so um, and it's not all cookie cutter. Every, some people are lifestyle, some people are medicine, some people are surgery. And, and I think the key thing I want to say is to be open and receptive to what may be needed. Um, so for that young woman I saw today, who's obviously fresh in my mind because I just saw her, um, I think this woman will need surgery. Um, the severity of her disease, the length of her severity of her disease, the fact that she was born already with um, what we call macrosomia in pediatrics, which means her body was large at birth and you feel a little sad for mom pushing that through the canal. Um, and that's something she's had, you know, that's something mm -hmm. she's had her whole life. Her mom also, who was on, the, on her video call with her today, had surgery, interestingly enough. She had a gastric bypass. So, and then when I go through the family history, they were able to name eight family members that have severe obesity. So she was set up. It was kind of the card she was dealt. You know, I'm obviously black. I'm not going to be white tomorrow. Like that's just the cards I was dealt. I think it's absolutely gorgeous that I was born this way. But the whole point yeah. is, is that that's the card set that I was dealt. Okay. And then I navigate what comes with that, the racism, the other things that come with that. That doesn't just change overnight. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, when we think about obesity and its heritability, meaning how likely am I to get it from mom and dad? If you have obesity, um, if the parents have obesity, the child's likelihood of having obesity is somewhere on the order of 50 to 85% likelihood. And that's even if we do everything perfectly. I mean, you can go and puree, you know, 
fresh vegetables and the blender and all kinds of things and no added anything and you breastfeed for two years because why not you know you can do all those things but unfortunately they're still coming from you know parents that had obesity and so that brain knows that and it's going to do what it can to kind of push it into that direction um not for everyone notice i didn't say a hundred percent likelihood and so some people are like well i didn't have that issue i said 50 to 85 percent mm -hmm. which means not a hundred but it is pretty high and so it's important i always like to say this that weight is more heritable than height mm -hmm. and so I, i'd like to say it again because it, it's really a major point weight is more heritable than height when we see people that have tall parents we're like oh she's going to be tall you know or he's going to be tall we see someone that has really short pairs. Oh, they're going to be really short, you know. Mom's four foot eleven, dad's five foot one. I mean, they could have a you know a shack sized individual, but the likelihood is probably low, you know. So it's important for us to think of weight in a similar way. There was um, one thing that I wanted to just touch on that Dr. Cody Stanford mentioned about how how your brain tries to get you back to that initial weight. And that's, um, that is so key for me because when I was in um, went medical school, long before you all, we never learned anything about obesity being a disease. In fact, we learned that it was a matter of willpower, right? And so now you, you have a situation where we know based upon the science that it is in fact a disease. And one of the reasons we know that is what Dr. Cody Stanford mentioned, oftentimes when an individual loses a significant amount of weight, we oftentimes experience, oh, I'm so hungry after I lost that weight. And we used to think that that was, uh, you just failed. You know, you, it was a lack of willpower, the fact that we continue to eat to get not just back to our original weight, but maybe even a little bit past that. But what the body does is it attempts, it makes those hormones that make us hungry, it increases that amount to get us back to what we call that set point or to get us back to that original weight. So it's designed to do that. So it's not a lack of willpower, it is the science of obesity. And I want to, um, yes, even though um, Dr. Gaines and myself um, finished med school later, I do want to say that as of- Not that much years, later. Just a few, few later. years later. Yeah. Um, as, as recently as 2019, I evaluated um, what are doctors learning in mm -hmm. medical schools, mm -hmm. residencies, and fellowships, not only here in the U.S., but throughout the world, and published the first review to look at this. And so medical students today, as, at least as, as late as 2019, yeah were not and are still not unfortunately learning about the disease of obesity we're still learning it's about willpower my audience that's usually most shocked by what i have to say are doctors because we don't learn it and so i also want to say that to you guys as a group as you're listening to us talk about this that if you go and your doctor says something completely different than what you're hearing dr earls and i say today that it's some of it actually a lot of it will likely be due to the fact that they weren't taught about the disease of obesity and so it can be hurtful because things they may say may reflect that you have failed i want you to realize that you have not failed and do not give up i never ever give up and it's important for me not to give up because I know that we may have to try this and this and this. And it may be when we get to thing number eight, that, mm -hmm. wow, that's what worked for that person. Mm -hmm. If we stopped at number five, then, you know, we stopped at number five. But what about all those other things that we still didn't get a chance to try? And so hang in there, be patient. You know, obesity doesn't develop overnight. It often takes even, you know, if you thought it happened in a year, it's gonna take three years often for us to address it or even longer, and that's okay. But just know that we're here as, as to help you. And if you're, you're facing struggles and finding that your doctor doesn't seem to have the same understanding that you're hearing today, there are th those of us out there. This is what we dedicate our life to, and we're there to help you be your happiest, healthiest self. Thank you both. Um, I will definitely put a link below this video on how to find an obesity medicine physician, as well as the other, the book and all the other links that were discussed. I'll put them all below. Um, I just want to thank the both of you guys for being here and all of you guys watching. Uh, please subscribe to the Black America's Health channel so that you can continue to get 
more content as we put it up and you can hit the bell to subscribe and have a wonderful rest of your day.